Hey, and welcome back. My name is Daniel Caproni, and I teach AP Stats for Western Hills University High School. Today we are looking at day 21 of this series where we are going to jump into our next set of hypothesis tests. Now, so far we've covered one proportion z-test, two proportion z-test, and now we're going to start looking at z-tests that have to do with quantitative data. So we will no longer have to worry about proportions, we are moving into just when we have the actual mean and standard deviation of a given set of data. These actually tend to be a little bit easier. So today we're going to discuss a little bit about what that looks like, and we're going to go ahead and look at both confidence intervals and hypothesis testing for one and two sample quantitative data z-tests. So we're going to go through all of that. Now, if you're feeling like you don't know what a hypothesis test is or you're feeling lost or confused, you can always jump onto YouTube and you can find any of the videos from this series. All 21 of them will be in there and any future ones that will be coming out. So again, thank you for being here today and I hope you guys learn something new. So with that said, let's start day 21 of AP Stats. So as I said, we're covering four different topics today. We're all working with quantitative data. We're going to do the one sample confidence interval, the two sample confidence interval, the one sample Z test, the two sample Z test. But here's the deal, we're done with proportions. So all of this is going to be pretty straightforward. Because if you think about it, a lot of the slides that we went through on the uh, past videos have been things where we talk about like, how do you find the standard error or the standard deviation or whatever of the, uh, like all the old stuff that we were going through for proportions. But in this case, a lot of the time, the formulas are very simple, very easy to use because each question is going to give us a mean and standard deviation. And this is where if you go way back to the sampling distribution chapter we did in chapter 17, we started talking a lot about the central limit theorem and how it says when you take samples like what we've been dealing with, the middle of your sampling distribution ends up being your mean. And then you just go up or down plus or minus the standard deviation to go each of the tally marks. All right. So there's nothing really super fancy about this. Then we end up finding out that um, once you change it into a sampling distribution instead of the norm, then I think you just divide that by the square root of your sample size, and that's the formula. There is no finding the mean or finding additional things like the P times Q divided by N, take the square root, all those things. So much easier here. So we're going to do a lot of the exact same things we were doing before. But instead now, by using the central limit theorem, we're able just to kind of jump right into getting ready. And a lot of this process is going to be exactly the same as what we were doing before. Now, the name of the game here is population standard deviation, all right? So this is super, super important in this case, all right? So important that I'm going to draw little lines coming off of it, all right, so that you guys all can see how important this is. Population standard deviation is what defines a z-test. When it comes to them giving us quantitative data, there's going to be two major types of tests. We're either going to have t-tests or z-tests. We haven't covered anything about t-tests yet. T-tests are going to be our last two videos of this series, which will be the next two. But z-tests are what we're already used to. It's where they give us the mean, they give us the standard deviation, and we just go, 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 go. But in order for us to run a z-test or a one or two sample confidence interval with z-scores, you must be given the population standard deviation or population standard deviations for the two samples in order for this to work, all right? So anytime they give you the population standard deviation, it is almost guaranteed that we are dealing with a one or two sample z-test. If you don't have the population standard deviation and you only have a standard deviation of the sample that we're using, that's when we're going to start moving into the t-test stuff, but we'll talk more about that later. So name of the game, population standard deviation, don't forget it, all right? Now, just to do some maintenance stuff here, I did already mention this, but remember the standard deviation that we would be using for these confidence intervals or for the uh, hypothesis testing is just the, old, the original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That means, like, for example, for confidence intervals, we're going to be having the mean that they give us in the sample plus or minus our little z star times the standard deviation formula that you see up there. 
So nothing really fancy there. In this case, we don't have to like change it and say what's the mean because it's actually going to be the mean. Because when we're dealing with what we're doing right now, the one or two samples, we're talking when we're doing something like measuring the heights of students or the average ACT score or where we have a list of numbers that we can actually find a mean and standard deviation for, not something where they just give us a probability and we have to remember what the mean and standard deviation formulas are. So this is much, much easier. Um, we can jump right in. Remember, we're still going to use our calculator for this, so nothing fancy. Now, as always, we do have a list of assumptions and conditions to go by, and you guys have already seen these back when we did the sampling distribution chapter. But as always, we have the randomization condition. Randomization condition just says that they have to be random, so that's nothing new. The 10% condition is also the same. Uh, it says that when a sample is drawn without replacement, sample size n should be no more than 10% of the population. This is the one that's slightly different. We have success fail when we deal with proportions, but because there is no success or failure here, we don't really have that condition to go by. Instead, it just says using your central limit theorem uh, knowledge, you just need to have a sample size large enough that will make our distribution normal which remember usually means you want a sample size of like 30 or more, or if the original data was already normal, then you can have any size, all right? Now this one down here that I put is separate from the other three because this is the one that we use for our two sample stuff. Um, this is the same as the two sample proportion one. It's the independent group assumption that says, hey, if we have two samples, let's say I have class A and class B, and I'm trying to look at the difference between their average scores, then that just means that, hey, one sample can't affect the outcomes of the other sample. That is our independent group assumption. It's saying that one sample that we get won't affect the other. So we're gonna jump right into doing a whole bunch of different questions here to go on. All right, so first thing we're gonna look at is a confidence interval question. It says in a random sample of 60 refrigerators, the mean repair cost was $150. Assume the population standard deviation is $15.50. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the population mean repair cost. Interpret the results. Now, here's the deal. What's this question asking? It's asking for us to find a confidence interval, but of what? It's saying, hey, you're going to go out and look at all these refrigerators, and you're going to find out the average repair cost of your sample. And they want you to guess what would be the average repair cost for all refrigerators out there. Now, we don't know the answer exactly, so we're going to give a range because that's what a confidence interval is, and we'll say that with 99% confidence, we believe that the true repair cost of a refrigerator is going to fall in that range. So you could go through, check the conditions and whatnot, but we'll do all that when we do the hypothesis test practice. But right now, let's just go ahead and jump into doing the question. So first off, let's identify. This is what we call, you know, like white a little bit better on here. This is what we call a one sample. Z, and in this case, it's confidence interval, but you could say it's technically like the Z test type things. But we are doing it for, um, what do you call it, confidence intervals, all right? Now, with that said, how did I know it was one sample? Because we have one sample in here. How do I know it has to deal with the Z, Z test? Because it says that we were given the population standard deviation. So remember, that's the key phrase we use here, population standard deviation. If we know the population standard deviation, we're dealing with a Z test, okay? Um, so you go through, all right, let's write down what things were given. We're told that N equals 60. Uh, we are told that the mean repair cost, so remember, because this is for a sample, we'll use X bar, not mu, um, that the sample mean was $150. We're told that the population standard deviation, so that's this guy, uh, is going to be $15.50. Now, technically, when your calculator is going to do all the work for us, it doesn't use this. It uses the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. But lucky for you, your calculator will do that, that whole computation for you. So you can just plug in the original data in your calculator, and it will give you the confidence interval. Boom, bang, done. So let's go ahead and jump over to our calculator and plug in the information that it asked for. So remember, we use a TI Inspire for this class. If you have a different calculator, feel free to Google how you would do a 
Z test confidence interval on there, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it. It's available on the TI 83, 84, and so forth. But we're going to do it on the Inspire. We go to menu. We know that once we get to menu, we can go to option six. It has both our confidence intervals and our hypothesis test on there. We're in a hypothesis or a confidence interval for this question. Notice we are not at the two sample yet. We said there's only one. We're done with proportions. We've moved on past that. So our option is either the Z or T. I already told you guys today we are looking at the Z interval. So we're going to go ahead and hit that. This window will pop up asking you, do you want to do data or stats? Here's the deal. If they gave you a whole list of raw data, like literally just all the numbers where you didn't know the mean or standard deviation yet because you just had a list of numbers, you could put that list in the spreadsheet on this calculator and then input that list via the data option. But in this case, they didn't give us a list of the raw numbers. They gave us the statistics that went with it. They gave us the mean, the standard deviation, and so forth. So what we'll do is we'll click on stats. Whenever they give you the summary statistics like that, you want to use stats, not data. So we go ahead and we hit OK. Now it's just plugging and chugging. On here, we said that the standard deviation was 15.50. Notice it doesn't ask for the standard deviation divided by square root of n. It just asks for the standard deviation, so we put in 15.50. That's standard deviation of a population. Um, it asks for your mean of the sample, which is 150. And it asks for our sample size, which was 60 refrigerators. In terms of our confidence level, we actually are not using a 95. This question asks for a 99% confidence level. So we go ahead, we hit OK, and look at that. It comes up with it all. It tells us the margin of error if we wanted it. But this question actually didn't even ask that. It just asked for a... Uh, confidence intervals, so all we know is the lower and the upper bound. So if we were going to bring those over here, maybe I can, let's see, we'll copy that, and let's see if they will pop over onto our screen. Um, well, they did, but they're up there and hidden. There we go. So these are the two numbers that we actually just picked up off the calculator. So if I wanted to write out our confidence interval, we could A, either leave it like that, or I could say that the mean of the population is probably somewhere between $144 and let's round that to 85 cents since we're dealing with money. We want two numbers after the decimal. And the top side of that is going to be 155.15. Now, this is our confidence interval, the stuff inside of here. It says that they want us to interpret the results. What does that mean? It means this, that with 99% confidence, we believe that the true average repair cost of all refrigerators is probably somewhere between $144.85 and $155.15. So that means anytime you get a group of refrigerators, you would expect the average cost of all the refrigerators to be somewhere between those two numbers. This can be very, very helpful for a company because if they're like, let's say, a kitchen or a restaurant of any sort, they're going to need a lot of refrigerators and they need to be able to budget accordingly to know how much they should keep in reserves for the refrigerators break down. So this would tell them, hey, in your budget, you should leave somewhere between $144.85 to $155.15. If you have that in there, more than likely your group of refrigerators, you will budget correctly for the cost of their repairs. So this can be very important for businesses, but this would be a confidence interval for one Z sample. J -j Jumping right along, we're going to look at now a confidence interval for a two sample Z test. Um, and you can read here, it says, Mr. Crony wants to compare the girls to the boys of West High through the years on the ACT to see if there is a difference in scores. He gets a random sample of 40 girls and 40 boys and finds the average ACT score for the girls is a 23 with an assumed population standard deviation of 5, and the average ACT score for the boys was a 20 with an assumed population standard deviation of 4. Give a 95% confidence interval for the difference of the scores by gender. So again, we are looking for a confidence interval, all right? And I know that we are looking for a two sample Z1 because, because we had this 
population standard deviation pop up for both samples. Now, I know it's two samples because we're talking about comparing boys to the girls. Um, so usually like that, that's a good indicator that it's a two sample one when you have two samples. Uh, but in this case, they did give us the population standard deviation. So that tells us it's a Z interval and we should be good to get started. Now let's go ahead and write down the information that we have here. First off, um, the calculator asked this in kind of a weird way, and I know that going in, so I'm going to list them kind of in a way that's going to help us in a second. We have to decide which one's one, which one's two. Since the girls were listed first and they have the higher ACT score, I'm going to go ahead and make them the one. So this will be the girl info over here, and the boy info will be over here, all right? And they'll be standard deviation number two. Um, so the standard deviation for the girls was a five. And the standard deviations for the boys were, let's see, it was a four. Um, then we had the sample mean of the girls, and that was a 23. And the sample mean for the boys, and that was a 20. And for both of them, N1 and for N2, our sample sizes were 40. So. At this point, I don't want to sit here and go through all the muck of explaining everything again because we've done confidence or interval after confidence interval after confidence interval. Why don't we just go ahead and jump right into what the calculator's got cooking for us? So, if I jump over to the calculator, I got all of my information on there. Um, let's go ahead and this is where we left off on the last question, but we're going to go to menu just like before. We're going to go to menu six for statistics, confidence intervals. And we are going to jump right into our two sample Z interval. Again, we already talked about why we chose that guy. Just like last time, we were given the statistics. So we're going to switch that data over to stats and hit OK. Now, we already went through all of this. So let's just go through it again. Standard deviations of the girls, five. Standard deviation of the boys, four. Average for the girls, 23. Sample size for the girls, 40. Average for the boys, 20. Sample size, also 40. And don't forget to scroll down a little bit further to see it does ask for confidence level. We're doing a 95, so we can leave it like that and hit OK. Now, there, since there's so much information here, you can't even see the lower at the moment. So you got to scroll back up. But you can see right here the lower and the upper pop up right here. I'm going to hit Control Copy and bring those numbers back over to our original. Um, and it's going to pop up there, so I'm going to bring that down for us. So what do these numbers mean for us? They mean that with a 95% confidence, I can assume the difference between girls to boys on the ACT will be anywhere from one point to about five points. So that means any sample I take of boys versus girls on the ACT, I would expect girls to do better by somewhere between one to five points. Now, I did round there. It's technically 1.01569 and 4.98431. But in general, if you're talking everyday lingo, we're going to say that means that if I take my girls minus the boys, it's going to be equal to something between one to five points. Okay. So this was a confidence interval for a two sample. Z interval. All right. So let's go ahead and start jumping into our hypothesis test. So let's get some of the semantics out of the way first. Remember, whenever we're doing a hypothesis test, the whole seven step process will still apply. A lot of those things are going to be the same. Um, some of them will be only slightly different. So again, when we're going through these, your first thing is to identify what type of test you're using. Obviously, since this is on our one sample Z test, it's going to be that first and then our two sample Z test. Uh, but from there, we need to go ahead and check our conditions. We need to write down our HOHA. We need to write down all the other information we got. We plug it all into the calculator. It shoots out a p-value. We see if the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject our HO. If the p-value is bigger than alpha, we fail to reject our null. Um, and then we go ahead and write out our conclusion based off of those results. That's our full process going through. So let's go ahead and get started with that. One notable difference is our HO and HA. You guys have been used to dealing with proportions for the HO and HA. But now that we are dealing with trying to figure out if the population mean is above or below a specific number, 
we're actually going to stop using the P here, and we're going to switch over to using our symbol for mean, which is that mu, the Greek letter M. So everything else is going to stay the same. They're going to give us some type of number in the question to work with. That number will go on this side. Our HO is still always going to be the equal sign, and our HA is always going to be what we're trying to prove. So it's either going to be greater than, less than, or not equal to, and you'll use this same number down here. So that's the major notable difference. Obviously, your conditions will change each time, but for right now, that's kind of the big one that will change from what we were doing before with proportions. So instead of writing the P, we are now going to be writing a mu for the mean. So let's go ahead and jump into our first question here. It says, in auto racing, a pit stop is where a racing vehicle stops for new tires, fuel, repairs, and other mechanical adjustments. The efficiency of a pit crew that makes these adjustments can affect the outcome of a race. A pit crew claims that its mean pit stop time for four new tires and fuels is less than 13 seconds. A random sample of 32 pit stop times have a sample mean of 12.9 seconds. Assume the population standard deviation is 0.19 seconds. Is there enough evidence to support the claim at alpha equals 0.01 using a p-value type situation? Now, starting off, there is only one sample in this, the one sample of 32. So that tells us we are dealing with a one sample test. Now, this is not a proportion because there's nothing about number of successes, there's nothing about probability of success, which means we are dealing with that quantitative data where it gives us the mean and standard deviation instead. Because it says population standard deviation up here, that's what tells me this is a one sample Z test because it says population standard deviation. So this is a one sample Z test, which means we need to go back to looking at the conditions for this test. First one, is it chosen randomly? It specifically says a random sample of 32 in the pit stop. So in terms of our random, our first thing, I'd say that that is a check. Next off, we have our 10% rule. 10% says, is this less than 10%? Well, I would assume there are far, far more pit stops than this, probably easily more than 320, which would make this 10% of that. So I'm going to go with, yes, this is solid. There's so many pit stops, so many races. We don't have to worry about that. It's going to be far, far, far higher than that. Next off, is this large enough? Now, remember, for our central limit theorem, if it was already normal, we can assume it's going to be good. Otherwise, we use the rule of thumb of being larger than 30. This is 32. So the large enough condition is going to be a check. We don't have that fourth condition because this is not a two sample test. So we can go ahead and stop at those three and say, we did it. So we checked our conditions, which means we are moving on to writing out all of our information and our HO and HA. Now, this one is a little bit different than other ones we've seen because in this case, they actually give us the HA. They want us to be able to support a claim that they are less than 13 seconds. Now, if I made less than 13 part of my HO, we all know that at the end of the day, we never accept a hoe, never accept a hoe. So that means that we need to either reject and accept the ha, or we fail to reject our null, which means if we wanna be able to support the claim, meaning we wanna be able to accept that they are less than 13 seconds, that has to be our HA. So our HA is going to be that the mean is less than 13 seconds. Now, <clears throat> with that said, our HO, remember, is always the same symbol, the mean. It's always the same number. And for our HO, we said it's always equal to. So this is actually a lot easier to do. We have it written out and we are good to go. What other bits of information do they give us? They tell us that the sample size in this case, N, is 32. They tell us that the mean of the sample, X bar, is 12.9. Man, that's really close to that 13. And the population standard deviation is 0.19. Last but not least, it does give us an alpha to work with in this question. And that alpha is going to be 0 0.01. Okay. So remember, at the end of the day, our calculator is going to shoot out a p-value. If that p-value is less than this guy right here, we will reject the hoe and accept the hop. If that p-value is greater than this guy right here, we will fail to reject a hoe and we will not be able to support the claim. 
So let's go ahead and jump over to the calculator and see what we're going to get. So as always, we're going to jump into the menu. For our statistical stuff, we're looking at confidence and interval stats down here. Stat test is what we want here. And we just said that we are looking at a one sample Z test. So that's going to be the top guy right here, Z test. And we click there. Again, data or stats, we've been given the stats. So we're going to switch to that and we're going to hit OK. What are the things they ask for? MO. This is just like PO before. It is the number you are using in your HO and HA. We said that that is going to be 13. Then for standard deviation, population standard deviation, which is what is it was a Z and not a T, we had 0.19. For the sample mean, we had 12.9. And for the sample size, we had 32. Now remember, this needs to change based on what our hollow alternative hypothesis was less than 13. So we go ahead and put the less than sign in there and we hit OK. Our p-value is 0.001454. So again, that p-value is 0.001454. So let's go ahead and jump back and see if this is small enough for us to move forward. So here we're going to go ahead and post this down here. Oop, it went up there anyway. So this is our p-value down here. Let's go p-val. Our p-value was 0 .001. 0 .001 is indeed less than our alpha of 0 0.01. Essentially, that would be 1% versus 0.1 of a percent. So our p-value is less, which remember, if we are less than alpha, we are able to reject that hoe. So in this case, we get to reject the hoe. So we are going to reject this guy. Reject that hoe. And we get to accept the alternative that it is indeed less than 13, which means in the end of the day, when we are writing out the sentence for this, we obviously would have all of our work written out and we would say, OK, end of the day, what's going on here? We would say, yes, we have enough evidence to support the claim that this pit crew can do their stop time in less than 13 seconds. So, yes, we are able to support that. If you want to change that around a bit, you could say. Because we reject our null hypothesis, we are able to accept that this pit crew can do their work in less than 13 seconds. So you would write all of that out for your sentence. You would call today. This was our one sample Z test. Let's move right on to our last one, the two sample Z test. Here we are in the fourth and final type of question we're looking at today. We've been crushing through it. I know you guys are ready. Are you ready? You don't have a choice because you're watching a video. So we're going to crush out this last one. It says, to compare the amount spent in the first three months by clients of two meal replacement diets, a researcher randomly selects 20 clients of each diet. The mean amount spent for diet A is $643. The population standard deviation is $89. The mean amount spent for diet B is $588. Population standard deviation for that one is $75. Alpha, 0 0.01. Can we support the claim that the mean amount spent in the first three months by client of diet A is greater than the mean amount spent in the first three months by clients in diet B? So first and foremost, I'm going to refer to A as 1, and I'm going to refer to B as 2. Let's just get that out of the way. Now, first things first, pick which test should we use? Obviously, there are two samples here. There is a diet A and there is a diet B. So that should not be rocket science. This is a two sample test. Now, again, it mentions the population standard deviation for each of the two diets, which means we are dealing with a Z test. If it did not say population, we would be concerned. But as of the moment, it says population standard deviation. That means we're dealing with a Z test. We have two samples. We're moving into our conditions. First one, is it random? Well, here's the deal with random. It says that they randomly selected 20 clients for each diet. Check. Second one, is this one going to be fulfilling the, what, 10% rule? 10%. Is 20 people going to be more than 10%? 
I bet not. Have you seen diets? A lot of times they pop up online. Everyone starts doing them. If it's the keto or the whatever Atkins or whatever they're on their little kick for at the moment, there's a lot more than 20 people. There's a lot more than 200 people. I'm going to call this 10% a success. Now, the next question, is this a large enough sample? By the central limit theorem, if it is already normal, we can go ahead and proceed. If not, we should aim for 20 or more. That's going to be an issue. So for this guy, I would claim we are unsure. What do we do when we un are unsure? We proceed with caution. So make sure that you put in there that in this case, we are not sure. So we're going to go ahead and proceed with caution. Now, remember, because we have two samples, our last one is whether it's an independent group one or not. Um, I don't want to write all that out, so I'm just going to write our group condition. Does being in diet A and getting an outcome change the outcome of those in diet B? No, it does not. It means that they are indeed independent of each other. So we can go ahead and call this a check. There's our four conditions. It is not fantastic because our large enough was not fully um, given to us. So we will be proceeding with caution. But from here, we can jump in to writing out everything we need. Number one, HO and HA. Here's the deal. In this case, just like the last question, we are trying to support a claim. So in other words, say that it is true. We can never, ever accept a hoe, which means the diet A, R1, is greater than diet B, R2, must be our HA because that is what we are trying to support. So I would write that out by saying the mean of one is greater than the mean of two. Now, technically, I could have went ahead and left that as the mean of A is greater than the mean of B, but I already clarified that those two things mean the same thing in the beginning. That way I could use a consistent symbol for every time we do questions like this. That means that our HO is just going to be the mean of one is equal to the mean of two. Now, just like before, sometimes this is written in a different way. You are capable of writing it as the mean of one minus the mean of two is equal to zero because that's just moving this M2 to the other side. So you subtract it to the other side. And down here, it would be that the mean of one minus the mean of two is greater than zero. Now, again, this is usually the case when it says something like, is there a difference between the two of these? Do you want to show it's, that the difference is greater than zero? Do you want to show that there exists a difference between the two? By saying that the difference between them is equal to zero, that's an easy HO because it claims that there's no difference between the two. You can write it either one of these ways. One is not better than the other. The calculator tends to go on this one over here. So if you like that format, then go for it. So remember, we do have a bunch of other information here. First off, it says 20 clients of each diet, which means our N1 and our N2 are both going to be 20. Next off, it gives us the mean of our first guy was 643. It tells us that the standard deviation of the first guy was 89. It tells us that the mean of our second one was 588. And the standard deviation of our second one was 75. And last but not least, they do give us an alpha. That alpha is going to be 0.01. We're going to be doing this at a 1% level, okay? So the level of significance, alpha 0.01. Remember, that is what we're going to be comparing our p-value to. At this point, we have all of our information. We have our HOHA. We've checked our conditions. We've listed what sample type we're going to. It's time to plug it all in the calculator and get that p-value. So we're going to hop right on over here. As always, we'll go to the menu. We'll check out our statistics. This is a hypothesis test, so we want to make sure we are in the tests. We have two samples now, so we're going to look at that two sample Z test. As always, data or stats. We want stats. It didn't give us a raw list. We're going to hit OK. First thing at once, standard deviation of the first group, which was 89, if we remember how we wrote it down. Standard deviation of the second group was 75. The mean of the first group, 643, 
the sample size for the first group, 20. The mean for the second group was 588. The sample size for the second group was also 20. And down here at the bottom, it says, which of the three types did we use for our HA? In this case, we chose the greater than to go along with what the question was asking. We hit OK, it pops up with our stuff. You can see right here, we have our p-value and all the other information you would need for a question like this. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that over and put it in our little document over here. Pull this down and let's compare that with our, <gasps> with our alpha. What's wrong here? It is very, very close, very, very, very close, but, 1.7% is larger than 1%, which means in this case, we fail to reject that hoe, which means we actually can't go any further, which means in context of this question, we cannot support the claim that diet A is greater than diet B. Now, if they had not been so greedy and went with a 5% for their level of significance instead of one, we would have been fine. But because they wanted a 1% alpha, we are actually above that by 0.7285, which means, again, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So when you're looking, if you were to write a sentence for this, I would say there is not enough evidence for me to support the claim that the mean amount spent in the first three months by a client of diet A is greater than a mean amount spent in the first three months by clients of diet B. So in this case, they didn't get what they wanted. We failed everything's a disaster but on the bright side we have finished our fourth question and type for the day which means that is all she wrote all right guys are you out of breath i know i am thanks for sticking with me through this i know it was a bit longer but we did cover four types of problems today which means we are just crushing through this stuff now that means that we only have two videos probably left. The first one's probably going to be explaining what a t-test is instead of using a z and how that all works and that will kind of either end with or launch into the next video where we have to cover one and two sample t-test instead of z-test which means we are almost there. Once we get through those two tests we are done for new content for this year. Then we can go ahead and start reviewing for that AP test. So as always guys, I hope this stuff was helpful. Remember, if you forget anything or wanna check back on some old videos, you can always go to my YouTube channel at Mr. Caproni on YouTube. No space, no period, just Mr. Caproni and you will find all the videos that you need. Well, I hope you guys learned some new things today. In particular, I hope you learned four of them. Um, as always, stay fit, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day.